I love Neolithic stone structures. I've visited a lot of them, every one that I could readily get to, many more than once. I love to walk among them, touch them, listen for the voices of the people who built them millennia before. My favorite spiritual practice is to stand in silence, a little way distant, totally aware of their magic, giving myself over to that sense of awe and wonder of the combination of ancient humans and stone. Because I also love stone, I grew up in swamp country and can vividly remember the first time I saw a mountain. I often carry a pebble in my pocket, rubbing its surface as a kind of prayer. So welcome to all you adventuresome Northwoodsian who dropped by this morning to share my passion. Sorry I couldn't be here in person, my Sunday mornings are, in this time of remote services, unavoidably committed. But I'm here with you in spirit, and will try to touch you a little so that you share a bit of my sense of wonder. I'm going to talk about building with stone for a while, show you some photos, mostly mine, but a few I've stolen from others, and then we're going to do some stone building of our own. Does that work for you guys? Okay, so here goes. Are humans smarter than animals? How many people out there think so? Raise your hand if you think so. Well, of course we are. At least that was the accepted answer 60 years ago when I was in fifth grade. We can stomp any animal at an IQ test, right? Now we're beginning to realize that we can only do that because we designed the IQ test. If another animal got to say what makes up IQ, what it means to be smarter, we might not be on top. Maybe the smartest creature today is the COVID-19 virus, and that's not even fully an animal, and yet it's kept us at home and on Zoom for the past year and a half. So if not strictly intelligence, what is it that separates humans from animals? Another answer when I was growing up is that we alone use tools, but that's not strictly true either. Chimpanzees use carefully selected sets of rocks to crack open hard nuts. They even strip and shape sticks before poking them in the termite nest to draw out tasty insects for lunch. As far as we know, I say this gingerly because who knows what we'll learn in the next 50 years, the one characteristic in which humans are unique is that we are intensely aware of our own mortality. We know that someday we're going to die. I speculate that this was the initial basis for man's special spiritual relationship with stone. The mountains in the distance never changed, even as our earliest ancestors passed from one generation to the next. And thus, all over the world, there are mountains and rock formations, not only magnificent to our eyes, but sacred to the native people who live there. Every culture has its creation story. From Genesis chapter 1, Then God commanded, Let the water below the sky come together in one place, so that the land will appear. And it was done. He named the land Earth, and the water which had come together he named Sea. And God was pleased with what he saw. Here is another from the Mi'kmaq people of Nova Scotia. This story is about the creation of the elders, the keepers of wisdom for the tribe. One cold autumn morning in a low valley, a great gray stone sat covered with dew. The rock was very old and it sat there for many, many moons. It had seen the passing of many animals and many seasons, but this day, as Niskum heated the rock and the dew rose as a mist from it, Niskum decided to give life to this rock. So as the rock grew hotter and the steam from the dew hovered over it, this one old rock was given the body of an old, old woman. That was Nukumi the grandmother. Geologists will tell you it didn't happen exactly that way, party poopers, and stone isn't nearly as permanent as we think of it from our short-lived perspective. 
but we live on a rocky planet, one composed overwhelmingly of minerals with only a small amount of such trivial things as water and air and carbon. And the first mountains rose billions of years ago, while we have been around less than a tenth of a percent of that time. Pick up one of your rocks. Feel its weight in your hand, its ungiving permanence of form and structure. Again, it's only permanent from our short-lived perspective. Someday it will be soil, or once again taken beneath the earth to melt in the great fiery pools of magma in that dynamic boundary between the earth's crust and mantle. But to us, if we leave it to our descendants as a family heirloom, it will still be here unchanged when our great-great-great-grandchildren pick it up and feel of it. Close your eyes and rub your thumb over it. Savor its texture. Choose another rock, one either smoother or rougher than your first. Discover and savor the differences. Touch it against your lips. Draw in a deep breath. See if you can detect the scent of the earth, of the millennia of its formation. Our earliest ancestors were not builders of stone, but in the Paleolithic era, or Old Stone Age, some three million years ago, pre-human homonyms made tools from stone. These are typically crafted of flint because it flakes easily. Our ancestors became quite adept at making useful tools quickly and efficiently from a flint core. And each advance made life a little easier. When our ancestors didn't have to spend as much time thinking, wonder what's for dinner? They had more time to think about the big questions. Who am I and what happens after I die? A sacred relationship indeed. By the end of the late Paleolithic period, our fully human ancestors had evolved, as had their special relationship with stone. The permanence of stone called to them to create art, and thus they painted on stone deep inside dark caverns. In France, art typically featured the animals that humans hunted and relied on for food. These date back between 13,000 and 28,000 years ago. But even earlier art featured handprints. An artist who wondered at their own mortality and expressed their sacred feelings on stone walls far away from the night. I grew up a big fan of cave art, but until I saw it for the first time in 2015, I had no idea how magnificent it was. Photographs simply don't do it justice. The artist used the curves and contours of the rock surfaces to create the three-dimensional appearance of their creations and the seeming movement. The stone is not just a convenient surface to paint. It's an integral part of the art. Another form of rock art from all over the world is called petroglyphs, or rock carving. Done with picking, chiseling, or flaking the surface away, these works of art from Australia to the Americans span from at least 27,000 years ago and perhaps as much as 40,000 years. So, another question. Are we smarter than our fully human ancestors 20,000 years ago? Raise your hands if you think so. Aha, you're not so sure this time, wondering if I might be tricking you again. This time the answer is easy. No, of course not. They have the very same human brains that we do. We know more than they do. We have the internet. Plus many generations of scientists exploring the world and conducting experiments to figure out how things work, technologies that build on earlier technologies, and the advances of writing and recording knowledge to make it possible for humans to acquire more than we can remember. But none of us can make a spear point from a flint core, predict the patterns of game animals, becoming ever warier of humans, or fashion clothing from furs and pelts to allow us to survive the winter. I can't. Now let's jump ahead about 15,000 years to the Neolithic or New Stone Age period.
Metalworking is still unknown or in its infancy, but agriculture is in full swing. Humans have been fully domesticated by wheat. Yes, that's what I said, sadly. Perhaps the most successful species in the last 10,000 years, wheat summoned people out of their relatively easy and carefree hunter-gatherer existence, forced them to leave their wooded homes in varied diets, to live together in villages or cities, do backbreaking work to clear and till fields, sow and tend the grain, harvest and thresh and bake it. Progress indeed. Tools were still made from bones or wood or stone, but by now the stone was mostly ground and polished rather than chipped, and often works of art as well as, as, well as implements of work, such as this axe head, perhaps the finest example known. Agricultural communities mean that people tend to stay in one place rather than roaming. Living in the same place for many generations also offered the opportunity to personalize the place, as in Scarabria, a 5,000-year-old village in the Orkney Islands, Scotland. You know, renovate and redecorate the old valley. Technology has also advanced to the point that humans became not just admirers of stone, but builders of stone. In Egypt, an advanced civilization with a fertile agricultural basis in the Nile River Valley, as well as a dedicated workforce. You know, a sizable underclass groaning under the boots of the priest and the rulers, supplemented by a substantial slave population, were able to commit substantial resources to building stone tombs for their deity-like pharaohs, and thus the Great Pyramids. These date from about 4,500 years ago marvels of engineering that have lasted for a very long time. But today is not intended to be a lecture in world architecture, and so let's move northwest by a couple of thousand miles to the land of the pre-Celtic culture, the megalith builders of the British Isles in Brittany. Actually, these people occupied much of Europe around six to 7,000 BCE before being crowded out of Central Europe by more fierce tribes and moving west. As in other parts of the world, some of the earliest stone buildings were tombs. But these were not tombs as we think of the word, or even as it is meant in Egypt, a burial place for the remains of a single person. Rather, these were typically communal graves, ancestral sites where certain bones, femurs and skulls are typical examples, of a number of people were buried after the flesh had been removed. A typical belief among prehistoric peoples, as well as primitives today, is that souls did not depart until after the flesh was gone. Bodies were often left for scavengers to cleanse or sometimes partially burned before the bones were moved to the tomb. One typical tomb of this type is called a long barrel. More than 40,000 complete or partial long barrels survive today. A long barrel consists of a long central passageway with alcoves on either side containing human remains. At some point, these were sealed off and covered with a large mound of earth, often with timber structures to hold the shape in place. Note that unlike the Egyptians and other stone builders in Asia, the pre-Celts of this period did not typically use dressed stones. Although sometimes stones were quarried using only stone, bone, and wooden tools, they were not shaped specifically for a specific purpose. Often huge boulders of granite were left behind by glacial movement, ready to be put to use in stone buildings. Megaliths, these massive stones are called, and the culture is often known as megalith builders. Tombs of this type were typically located on high ground overlooking a particular tribe's territory, serving as territorial markers between tribes. The spirits of the ancestors interred there would oversee, bless, and protect their descendants in the valleys below. Also, it is believed that if a member of the tribe moved away, say in a marriage to a member of another tribe, they would take a bone from an ancestor with them to preserve their family heritage and maintain the guidance and protection. Long barrows and similar tombs date from about 5,000 BCE. So some of the structures have stood intact for 7,000 years. Also, Many sites in Great Britain and France were in use for several centuries, with later construction being added onto land that was already considered sacred. Here's a photograph of Stonehenge, which we'll cover later, showing a number of much earlier barrows in the distance. 
Note that these are later circular barrows, but the concept is the same. A similar type of construction is the passage tomb. This is a distinct feature of Ireland, but examples exist across the British Isles. A passage tomb has a long passage with a funerary chamber at the end. The entire structure is covered with a large mound. The most famous of these is Newgrange outside of Dublin. The exterior has been restored, but the interior is absolutely untouched after more than 5,000 years. Imagine being an archeologist that first uncovered the entrance and made his way into the passage. The exterior of the Newgrange Passage Tomb was reconstructed in the 1970s to the embarrassment of many archeologists to look like a modern day structure with an imposing stone wall that nobody except the man who did the reconstruction, Michael O'Kelly, thinks was there originally. Critics have described the front wall as looking like a cream cheese cake with dried currants distributed about, or a bit brutal, a bit overdone, kind of like Stalin does the Stone Age. Unfortunately, there's little money or appetite for another revision. But here's the real magic about Newgrange. Around the winter solstice, at sunrise, a beam of sunlight makes its way down the passage over the span of a few minutes to strike the quartz flex stone at the end, lighting up the entire chamber. There's an annual raffle for access with millions entering and only a few dozens being able to be present to see the miracle if the clouds cooperate. There are two other known giant passage tombs very close to Newgrange, Nowth and Douth. The interior of Douth has been damaged by ham-handed amateurs using dynamite for quick access and is not accessible. But all three display a unique feature to Irish Neolithic structures, carved curbstones around the outside of the mound. Indeed, more than 80% of the known carved megaliths in the world are found in Ireland. The main passage tombs are surrounded by smaller tombs to form one large, thrilling, and complicated complex. There are dozens of passage tombs in Ireland and a few others across the Irish Sea in Great Britain. While none are as magnificent as those in the Boyne Valley, they have an advantage over the larger and more popular sites. You could visit them without crowds all around. It is a sacred experience being among stone structures built thousands of years ago by people very much like us. Our ancestors, with many of the same dreams and ambitions and hopes and fears that we have. While crawling around in one of these, I managed to lose my passport, which I only discovered an hour and some 20 miles later. But there it was, deep inside the passageway, that's just as I knew it had to be. One more before we move on. A passage tomb in the Orkneys, Mays Howe. The construction of the chamber inside, 4,800 years old, is exquisite. Curiously, this tomb was broken into by stranded Vikings who wintered there in the 10th century. They left their graffiti carved on the wall inside. A related type of tune is known as a court tomb. These are like a long barrel, except they have a courtyard in front for the holding of ceremonies. Imagine the priest performing ancient rituals while the members of the tribe solemnly looked on, chanted or danced along, feasted, or offered their own gifts. And then stepping away from the world of the living through the entrance to the world of the dead to inter the bones of the recently deceased to lie with ancestors from generations past. Most of these examples had timbered roofs beneath earthen mounds, so when the timbers rotted and collapsed, there would have been just a sealed mound remaining. So you have to use your imagination a little more. A later type of tomb is known as a portal tomb or dolmen. These are from much later, 2500 to 1500 BCE, 
at the juncture between the Stone Age and the coming of metal technology. These burial sites were principally for a single person, most likely a chieftain, king, or other venerated or powerful person. The classic structure is three stones, although sometimes more, around the sides and back, with a massive capstone on top. Often these were sealed and buried beneath a cairn of stones or earth, as, this, as in this example outside Inverness. This magnificent example of a portal tomb in western Wales lay hidden beneath an unprepossessing mound of earth until excavated in the 20th century, some 4,000 years after it was buried. Standing stones are another type of megalithic structure. Standing stones dot the British, Irish, and Brittany countrysides. Since it's impossible to tell the dates of most single or small groups of stones, some could be relatively new, a couple of thousand years, say, while others were erected 7,000 years or more ago. They exist in pastures and fields, beside roads, in front of pubs. I love standing stones. I love to put my hands on them, giving them a chance to speak to me. I try to sense the presence of my forebearers who erected this nat natural monument and then stood on the exact piece of ground where I'm standing, appreciating their accomplishment. Often standing stones are erected in larger groups. Here's one where the hillside is just scattered with stones, although it's possible at some point there was a more discernible order. At Karnak, in south of Brittany, there are three alignments of 900, 1200, and 1300 stones in orderly rows, arranged from smallest to largest. Magnificent, totally sacred, and the purpose or reason for the existence completely unknown. I personally believe they are erected just because the people could do it. We're like that, you know. Here is one particularly fascinating standing stone, the broken Minier of El Gra, located in Brittany, not far from Karnak. The largest known megalith in the world, it now lies abandoned, intentionally broken into four pieces. X-ray analysis of the site shows that there are originally 13 standing stones graduated from ones only a few feet above the ground to this massive giant. But they were all pulled down millennia ago. The second largest of the standing stones was broken in two and used as the capstone of two separate tombs, one about five miles away, the other right beside the original monument. This reuse is confirmed because the stone was broken across the carving of an ax, half of which is in each tomb. So was this massive effort undone because of a change of the gods? A conquering tribe from across the sea? A second wife tired of putting up with the old queen's decor? Nobody knows. And then we have stone circles and hinges. Stone circles are everywhere in Great Britain and Ireland. Small, large, complete, broken, tall, tiny. Sites with five or more circles right out in the open a quiet circle barely visible among the gorse or on a sheep grazed hilltop. Stones close together are widely spaced. Most are thought to be newer than the great tombs, but unless they're associated grave goods or bones or the remains of a campsite by the people who erected it, dates are often quite problematic. A hinge is a circular ditch in bank. The great hinges such as Avebury and Stonehenge began their lives as a holy site consisting of a simple ditch and a bank of the excavated soil and chalk, constructed long before any stones were added. I say simple. The hinge at Avebury was about 45 feet tall from the bottom of the ditch to the top of the bank, all shining white chalk. It had to have been a stunning sight, particularly when you remember that it had been constructed without any metal tools, no shovels, no picks, no steam engines. Scapula of large animals and stone picks did the heavy construction work. Avebury might be my favorite place in the world. The hinge is more than a half mile in circumference with a village right in the middle of it. The standing stones are undressed and weigh as much as 45 tons with sheep grazing in between. The stone circle almost survived intact from Neolithic times to the present 
But during the Middle Age, the church considered it the work of the devil and tore the stones down. Many are missing now, broken up and reused for buildings, but the ones that were buried in place have been re-erected. Abri is a large and complex site. There's a mile-long walkway originally between pairs of standing stones the entire way. Unexcavated barrels dot nearby hillsides. The West Kenneth Long Barrel that we visited earlier is just over the ridge. And a very peculiar, unique structure, Silsbury Hill. Man-made, it is estimated to have taken 18 million man-hours to erect. An ancient Roman road runs around it, so it was well established by that time. Why spend that much time and effort to make a giant mound of earth with enough internal structure to keep it in place? Your guess is as good as any archaeologist's. Another nearby site is Wood Hinge. Today it consists of painted posts marking where original posts were erected. Stone may not last forever, but it sure beats wood for permanence. Avebury is also the site where the stones for the most famous Neolithic stone structure were quarried and then hauled overland for 20 miles to Stonehenge. A long used site with various phases of construction spanning hundreds of years, the most recent with the famous uprights and cross pieces is relatively recent among megalithic monuments. Dating from the Bronze Age, it is sometimes considered the work of people who were more familiar with wood construction than stone, since the pinion joints of the, joints of the cross pieces are more reminiscent of wood building techniques. Regardless, it is an absolutely magical place, a must see if you ever get the opportunity. And as you can see from the picture, sometimes real magics happen there. Imagine bumping into friends from Northwoods there on the Salisbury Plain, literally. I was moving back to take a photo when I bumped into someone, turned to apologize, and it was Craig Kaminsky. Okay, enough history lesson and sightseeing trip. Let's play with some rocks. Okay, so now we're going to actually do some building with Neolithic building with stone. On a fairly small scale, of course. I've got my pie pan here. Any dish that'll hold your sand will work. I'm going to pour myself a good foundation of earth to do our construction work in. Pack it down here. Remember, appearance counts. We're making this sacred to the gods. We're making it sacred to our ancestors, to the spirits of the dead. So... You want to be beautiful as well as creative. Of course, that's, each stone builder has their own style, so you don't have to do it like anybody else. This is uniquely yours. All right, that looks fairly boring, so I'm going to sprinkle a little of this granite on the top of it to give it some texture and depth. There we go. All right. I'm going to look at my rocks, I'm going to feel them, see which ones speak to me. I think I will use these. All right, if I were Irish, I would probably chip this curb stone, but since I'm not, I'm going to use a Sharpie instead. And I'm going to make a spiral on it, a sacred symbol. These are found in curbstones, as you saw, all over Ireland. All right, so I'm going to make a portal tomb, which is the three-sided with the capstone. I'm going to have mine fairly low to the ground, and maybe we'll try one that's not so low. Get my sides in and sturdy my back the real classy builders just use a tip on it all right and then a capstone remember this is going to weigh something like 30 or 40 tons and so getting up there is going to be a real challenge except in our scale it's not so much and there we have our basic portal tomb okay so 
They like to separate the living from the dead with some quartz. I didn't give you any of this, but you can use anything that looks like that. Rice would be a good sample. And then in mine, I'm going to put a standing stone. So let's put a standing stone right there. So now this is gonna be on a hillside, overlooking a hillside where the spirits can oversee what's going on. I think I'm going to change my style to where it's got a high look. There, that offers a better lookout over the horizon, I think, don't you? And maybe we'll put about an altar stone here. That should please our spirit of our grandfather, don't you think? There we go, we have our very own Neolithic portal tomb. Some of them, I remember, have more sides so you can do that as well. I tried to give everybody a selection of rocks, but it's possible your rocks won't all do this, but you can go outside and search for your own. So there's one that has a more sealed sides and back. Now, once this tomb was in place, often it was completely covered. It was, the entrance was sealed, the whole thing was covered with a mound, and you saw some of those that they dug down in the mound and they uncovered these very things. Some are left out in the open just like they are, never having been covered, depending on where they are. Okay, I'm gonna take this apart. I'm gonna build a hinge. So I won't try to get this out of there, that'll be more difficult. Remember, a hinge starts with a ditch and a bank. Our Neolithic people used only stone, wood, and bone tool. So to be authentic, I'm going to use this jawbone. Of course, they probably would have used a scapula and not a jawbone since it's not very big. But I'm going to make myself a ditch and a bank. You can see the dirt that's excavated ends up making a pretty impressive height from the bottom to the top when it's done this way. And if this were in England, this is often chalk or limestone, and so this would be white. It would be a distinctive white color against the background of normal vegetation. Okay, we're going to leave a pathway, a passageway, pathway to the regular world. There's your pathway to the regular world. It's right there. Okay, so what we have here is a simple hinge. Any like stone hinge or abri or any of the stone circles that began as hinges often spent the first few hundred years or even a thousand years as nothing more than this. Or often there would be an entrance standing stone by the pathway in. And sometimes there's a recumbent stone which the rising or the setting sun would be right over the top of the recumbent stone. And then later on, we're going to add a stone circle. We'll say this is uh, 500 years later and we decided the new priest wanted something more elaborate. A lot of the stones at Avebury have exactly this shape. They have masculine and feminine stones. One that's shaped like that is a feminine stone and the ones like this are masculine stones. 
And so we now have our very own hinge and stone circle. And we can put a larger stone in the middle and maybe an altar stone. We call these altar stones. Nobody really knows what they were used for. Probably not sacrifices, but you never really know. So in any case, you have enough sand and enough stones to play to your heart's content. Um, you can leave it set up for a while and venerate it if you like. Leave offerings of uh, Kool-Aid and Oreos for your ancestors or you can uh, throw it out in the backyard and go on about your Sunday. But anyway, enjoy playing with your stones and thanks for coming.